Hey, I'm Bill Monk. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connor Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connor Show. Bill Monk, welcome to the Sarah O'Connor Show. How are you today? I'm oh, excellent. I'm doing great. Fantastic. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Now, you are, of course, the creative director, senior animator, the co-founder of Tripwire Interactive. And so you tell me a bit about how the studio was set up. Actually, uh, our studio's uh, history is, is pretty interesting. We, we started off in early 2000 um, as mod creators. Um, and we just had a passion and a love for, for making video games. And, and there was a group of people that kind of all shared the same kind of goal where we wanted to get into the industry and, and, and make cool games that wouldn't exist uh, if, um, if we weren't there to, to make them. And uh, we all started, like I was saying, we all started out as uh, mod creators and we were working on this mod called Red Orchestra. And we all worked online and there was people all over the world um, using uh, IRC chat. So, some old school people know what I'm talking about. And uh, yeah, we were working on the mod and it was the craziest thing where when I got out of school, I actually, out of college, I was really struggling to break in, into the industry. Mm. And I was a, a little bit insecure with myself as a lot of artists can be you know, thinking you're not good enough or whatever. And, and I was like, all right, well, you know, a good way I could do it would be to work on mods. So um, I started, you know, trying to do research of like different cool mods that were out there. And then I happened to stumble upon Red Orchestra and I had this crazy feeling that it was my destiny to go all in on working on this mod. And uh, so that's what I did. And uh, the crazy thing was, is probably about a year into it, uh, Epic, um, which is the game engine we develop on, announced a new making something a real competition. And the winner of that would be able to use the rights to, uh, on the game engine to sell it on the market. Oh, wow. And I was like, holy crap, because we had already been working on it for a year. I was like, holy crap. You know, then I really felt justified on my, because a lot of people thought I was crazy. They're like, why are you trying to find a job somewhere? What are you doing? You know, I was working as a, a dishwasher um, at, you know, restaurants, anything I could find just to, to, you know, so I could put all of my energy into the mod. And then, you know, so that gave us a really big head start. Um, and there are actually hundreds and hundreds of other people that were, you know, involved in this competition, but all the, a lot of those people all started once they heard about it. And we were, you know, we were a year ahead and we were, you know, blessed and fortunate enough to, years later to win first place That's amazing. and then we uh as a group we were like well where are we gonna you know where are we gonna go to start a company and we were trying to figure out like where was the you know cheapest place to go because we barely had two pennies we could scrape together and john gibson um who's the president of tripwire he's like well you know my wife uh there's a uh, church that they they went to and they rent out the second floor to businesses. Maybe they'll give us a good deal. So for 150 bucks a month, they rented out uh, a room to us with all utilities and everything paid for. And um, I was living in Baltimore, Maryland at the time. I drove down there uh, to, uh, you know, and I, none of us had met each other yet. Oh, we, wow. all, we all worked online, um, but I was young. I was in my twenties. I figured if it didn't, if it didn't work, who cares? And, uh, you know, um, drove down to Georgia and very long journey, 15 years later, um, we, you know, we're still around and, um, now we got a chance to make a, uh, you know, main eater, which is a very different, unique thing. Um, it really is. Congratulations on the launch. Oh, thank you. And it's, it's a departure from your previous games, isn't it? Because you predominantly worked on first-person shooters, whereas this is a third-person action role-playing game, and you're a shark. Yeah. So for the uninitiated, for someone who thinks a man-eater is just a really catchy Nelly Furtado song, what is man-eater about? So Mania is an action RPG um, where you play as a shark, and it's open world, uh, and you start out you start out as the mother shark, so you kind of get to feel what it's like to be powerful. And then through some things that happen, you know, for anyone who hasn't played it, don't want to, don't want to ruin anything. Even if it's not the most insane story ever. Uh, you, you then play as a baby shark. 
and you have to grow into a thing of mega size and you know going around you know eating stuff and growing and leveling up it's a very unique experience too because all the other rpgs and i'm a huge fan of rpgs and just video games in general um when you level up you know, you get new gear, you get new equipment, um, and that's super awesome. But the thing that really intrigued me with Main Eater was like, well, how about if every time you level up, you actually just get bigger? Right. And uh, that was that's a very unique thing because you know, as you're playing through the game, you start out and you're you know really tiny, and then eventually you're so big that uh, you know, like a human's like a you know cigar or toothpick in your mouth. So it's a, you know it's uh. You know, and, and it's a, it's a fun it's a fun game, and you know we have uh, you know, a lot of really smart writing and with the the narration of it, and the uh, the guy that does the voice is Chris Parnell, which was a dream come true for us. He, he used to be on Saturday Night Live, didn't he? I mean, some yeah. amazing stuff. Oh, he's hilarious! I mean, he is hilarious. You know, it's actually an interesting story because when we were with main eater we were really trying to figure out a way like how do we how do we tell a story or or make you feel attached to this thing that can't talk you know it's not human um we were brainstorming a lot of different ideas and you know we kind of were thinking like oh you know maybe a national geographic special where you know you're seeing hilarious things the guy's talking really serious and you know we, we we started riffing on that and then we Kind of start landing on like oh let's do a reality tv show um you know like they have on discovery channel and stuff like that and our audio director um mark morowski he was like oh you know who'd be perfect for this chris parnell and i, I remember i was like dude there there's no way he's gonna want it that he'll do this and he's like well uh, let's give it a shot you know and um he got back to us and he he loved the concept so we were through the moon to to have him, you know. That's amazing. And so, how much how much audio dialogue did he have to record? I guess it's hours worth, right? How much? Oh, oh, God! It's yeah, it's over. It's over a thousand lines. I mean, there's a lot. It was multiple different sessions. Mm. Um, I don't really know like how all the total hours added up, but it was multiple, multiple sessions that we did, and then in the end, we did some pickup sessions. Uh, but you know he he's awesome to work with so yeah it's a lot of fun when you're playing the game it really amplifies all the action that's happening and there's commentary when you discover stuff and it's really entertaining all the way through and it's definitely a highlight for me. oh awesome yeah thank you that that will make a lot of people on the project very happy to hear that and they really it's just a lot of fun to listen to and you want to interact with and try different things just to hear what the game's going to say to you yeah yeah yeah, I'm always a big fan of that element um, in, in all the games that we've done. Um, I always try to, to take that to the next level, like what you hear people saying, because it's kind of part of the, the entertainment. Um, in our first game, that, that we, series that we did, the Red Orchestra series, and Red Orchestra 2, uh, we came up with this like really you know, detailed uh, you know, um, combat dialogue system where like you know, every action that would happen the guys would say different stuff and if their morale was low they would say it differently and i'm just really intrigued with that concept mm. so each game we do we try to take that you know to to you know more and more levels yeah and because it gives the player even if you've completed the game there might be stuff you haven't done yet so you can go back and play through it and hear different stuff and experience new things which is really rewarding yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the way he set it up is there's not, uh, it's difficult to hear everything. Right. Uh, yeah, and I can totally appreciate that because I, I have this thing when I'm playing third person adventure games or whatever where I rarely complete them because I get so lost in the world just exploring stuff. Yeah. And, you know, if it's like GTA or Saints Row going down every street and exploring every rooftop, and this game going down every sewer pipe and yep. just interacting with everything and then bouncing along the seashore to see if I can get somewhere new before I suffocate. Yeah, <laughs> floppy fish. Yeah, so um, uh, I love floppy fish. Uh, so when we, were, when we were working on it, so like whenever I, I, I head up a project, I, I like to, um, you know Bruce Lee, that saying he said to be like the water. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if it's a cup, fill the cup. Yeah, and, yeah. And crash so like, as we're, yeah, as we're developing, you know, like you have your concept and idea, but I always try to like be in tune with like happy accidents and and new discoveries from from anywhere from any person. And when we were developing it, uh, you know, it was like in a real early rough stage. Um, you know, we had it where uh, you know the shark was just kind of like flopping on the, on the ground and, and you know a bunch of people were like this is really weird and it's kind of stupid i was like dude no no no, no. we we gotta go all in on this because i think it's just a kid in me <laughs> you know doing it and i'm laughing i'm like this is amazing you know and you can like jump on the boats and just sit there and look around and flop on the boats and yeah just uh it's super silly and and it's great because i've had plenty of people say hey that's one of my favorite things about this game <laughs> you know yeah, I like now my shark has got to the point where I can air hop through the air so I can do, you know, like Super Mario, you can do like a double jump. Yeah, I can now do oh, like yeah. a triple shark jump in the air. Yeah. Yeah, that was another one where we had like the lung, the lunges and yeah. um, when we were in the early prototyping. It was not initially intended, but I, I loved it so much that I was like, guys, no, 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 we, let's, let's make this go even more ridiculous, you know, because it's just fun to jump out. Like you said, double, triple jump. It is. Flips, you know. You can recreate the trailer from Free Willy and do these majestic dives through the air. Yeah. And, and it breath. actually adds a lot to the combat. Yeah, like, it really um, yeah, absolutely does. And so can you tell me how long the game was in development for? How long was it just in the planning stages before you started iterating on doing demos and stuff like that, tech demos? Yeah, so... Um, Mania is actually a really interesting development story. Um, it's not so cut and dry. It's just like, oh, you know, we just decided to do a new thing. So originally, um, a, a guy named Alex Quick, and he's actually the original creator for Killing Floor, which is one of the titles that we did. Right. He was working, you know, um, so with Main Eater, he was working on a game called Death. Um, and he was looking for, you know, to do something different. And I, and, and, and I remember it's, it's kind of interesting how the full circle happened because I kind of planted the seed in his mind. We were at a uh, San Francisco GDC bar. This was years, years ago. And uh, when he was working on depth and uh, you know, we're just having some drinks. I'm like, dude, you know, it'd be so awesome. You know, what you've made, if it was a, you know, it's a single player, you know, like, like GTA style, and you're just going around and like eating people and, you know, doing all this crazy stuff. And, um, you know, and we, we talked, we laughed about it and stuff. And, and, you know, at that point I thought, oh, that's, that's the end of that discussion. And then, you know, he went off and then he started working on it. He actually was working on Main Eater for two years. Oh, wow. Um, and formed a company called Blindside with a lot of other really creative people. So they were, you know, working on, on, on this concept. And then, um, John Gibson, our, our president, he, he saw it and he was, he really saw like the potential it had. And they brought it into the studio. We looked at it and then, you know, and, um, I, you know, when I saw it, I was really just, I was really fascinated because it was just the opportunity for just doing some really weird, totally different, you know, but, but in the same way, kind of a similar feel to it. Like, you know, you get it, but it's different. But at the same time, it's kind of the same. I don't, it's hard to describe. But um, so then, uh, you know, we, we originally were publishing it. And then uh, I believe it was uh, in 2017 or 2018. Sometimes I, I lose the, when, when the actual year was. At the PC Gamer Show, we announced it. And the fan reaction was, was like huge. People were like going nuts. I remember sitting on the stage with John. I looked at him, I was like, dude, we should think about taking this in-house and, and, and really put the tripwire, you know, spin, seal on it. Um, so then, you know, we, we worked with Alex and uh, then we took it in-house. Right. And then um, as far, and, and then at that point, that's when I was heading the project up and it was a, in, in all, it was about, um, you know, about 15, uh, 15 to 16 months. Okay. Um, very intense, you know, um, yeah. time uh, to, to, to get it. But, um, 
was a very it was the, it was the hardest project I've ever done in my life. Um, but also, you know, it was the most rewarding, I think, too. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think because it's a new gameplay engine and you're literally starting from scratch and there's every possibility of what can go right, but also what can go wrong and it's all oh. a balance and all that kind of thing. So the fact that you managed to turn it around in that time is incredible. So how, how big is your development studio? How many people work there on the dev team? So uh, our, our studio now actually is uh, 90 people. Oh, wow. Um, which is you know pretty pretty substantial, hmm. but there's about uh, 40, 45 uh, people on main here, right? Out of the group. And so you're based in Georgia. Do you, mm -hmm. do you get any sort of support from the the government in Georgia to, to help develop video games? Oh yeah, I mean that that was actually another amazing aspect. So when we first started the company in Georgia, they didn't have that, right? Um, and and then they added that later. So uh, Georgia has been instrumental to helping us be successful, um, you know, with their um, tax breaks and, and benefits right. and stuff like that. We're very, very thankful for that, and, and we hope it never goes away. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting. Atlanta is actually um, growing as a hub for a lot of a lot of entertainment. Yeah, because um, filmmaking too. I think the, one of the last Marvel films they did that is that right? Yeah, I mean, Walking Dead, tons of, yeah. tons of shows, ser um, uh, Ozark. Uh, I love Ozark. Yeah, oh yeah. That's Pretty a good, good one. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. So basically, whenever you see a movie, you, mm -hmm. and the credits, if you wait at the end of whatever, you see a little Georgia Peach, then you know, because um, you got to put that Georgia Peach on there to get the, uh, <laughs> the benefits. Small price to pay. Sure. Now I'm gonna be. I'm gonna to have to rewatch every film I've ever seen now and look out for the peach just so that I know, so I'm better informed in this. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the games are on PC, PlayStation Four, and Xbox One. Can you give any tips to people that have just started playing the game? What should they be thinking about or trying to do first? Yeah. So um, you know, I mean, first off, you know, like going and ex you know exploring. I would say probably the biggest tip that I have is uh, upgrade your sonar. That's your first ability that you get, um, because the every time you upgrade it, it, it increases the radius of detecting things. So by being able to detect the things, you can explore and find stuff easier, which helps you level up. Um, and then the other tip that I would give people is, um, you know, when you encounter like wildlife. It's generally best to to you know kind of look at it like a, you know like a like a like a boxing match or a fight. Let them make the first move and then dodge them and counter them. Because if you just go and try to bite them, um, they they can they can you know they can dodge you, move out of the way, and it can be a lot harder. But if you wait for them to uh, to attack first, dodge them, then go in for your attack. You know, and I would say the next tip is you know. Uh, size in, in man eater matters. So uh, if you fight something that's bigger than you, you know uh, it can grab you and hold it, hold you in its mouth, which is not good. But when you are as big as it or bigger than it, you can now bite it and grab it in your mouth. Um, because so yeah. when, when I first started playing the game, I accidentally swam into the path of an alligator, and oh, yeah. it was very stressful. And the battle lasted about five seconds, and then I had to restart. And then, so I was, so I was trying to work out if I could defeat it. It was just tough, and I tried several times, and then I kind of gave up. But then, when I leveled up a bit, and I came back to, I think I was one level below the alligator at that point. I managed to just about beat it, but I had like no energy left and then a few levels later past that then I could actually take them on and it was really satisfying because this massive monster thing which had been menacing you throughout the entire game you can now sort of stand up to yeah yeah that's um yeah that's uh I'm glad I'm glad you noticed that because that was a kind of a special aspect um I always find it fun when you when you play a video game and you feel like you can get revenge on something that was like tormenting you Mm -hmm. And it, uh, you know, because you can actually get big enough in main ear, where when you bite it, it can't even fight back. You just grab it in its mouth. Okay. So it, it literally flips completely opposite from when you start. You know, when you start, it's like, oh my god, what? 
you know, and it's funny too when I watch streamers playing because they some people get mad, like, why are they throwing this thing that's so difficult? You know, I can't, you know, but you can run away from it, you know. Um, but you know, that that revenge aspect is just uh, I just find that entertaining. So, um, you know, I'm really? glad there's that. Yeah. Here's another tip instantly, which I found out last night, is if you're attacking an alligator and you're now slightly a higher level than it, say the alligator's level 8 and you're level 10, be careful there isn't a level 15 alligator there as well and you don't accidentally buy the wrong one. Because the, <laughs> cause I did that. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta watch out when they're, they're the higher levels, you know. Like, you mm -hmm. can get, like... You know, because I, I mean, obviously, since since I I made it and I'm sitting there uh, tinkering with all the things, like I know exactly what the cadence to do. Um, but you know, and that's one interesting thing too with Man Eater that I'm really proud how it turned out is um, you know we you can decide how hard you want the experience to be based on just what you fight. So right. it's like you know, if you really want something extremely hard, you know. When you're like a baby or or you know just a small teen, go fight you know a hunt alligator that's level fifteen is gonna be really hard. But if you wait, you know, and you just sit there and you like build up, you know, and you're now uh, the same level as it, it's normal difficulty. But if you're like two X bigger than it, it's like pff, whatever, you know. So I just found that you know fun. Absolutely, and so the the game to me was kind is kind of like obviously a cross between Echo the Dolphin, mm -hmm. Grand Theft Auto, Tony Hawk skateboarding, and so I love <laughs> kind of love that because there's it's relaxing swimming through the environments, but then it's really stressful when you hop it. Well, I don't know how you obey things, but I go up to the surface and basically bounce along the top of it, and then go try and hide in a pipe or something to run away from stuff. And so there's these really intense battles and then it's this serene environment where there's turtles and it's really relaxing and I love the sort of balance of that. Oh thank you yeah I mean um that that's just uh that's just an element that uh you know um I think when you can have like like if you can have a game where you have like really kind of relaxing kind of chill with with real intense stuff when you want um, you know, it, it, it's more of an enjoyable experience because you kind yeah. of just shoot, you know. Because uh, you, you're, you're completely in control of it too because you, you mostly have, obviously if you go into the path of an apex predator, they're going to try to eat you. But apart from that, if you don't start attacking loads of humans on the beach, the hunters aren't going to come and try and get you. So you can peacefully explore as much as you want really. And then when it's time to upgrade, you can go and try and do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, can you tell me what kind of things you researched for the sharks? Did you go and see sharks in the aquariums, or did you watch a lot of movies and documentaries to study the movement of them and how they live? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, there's the Georgia Aquarium that, that's like, you know, 25 minutes from our office that we would, you know, check out, uh, watching movies, you know, did a lot of did a lot of like YouTube, you know, research. Just uh, I like to watch things in slow mo. Mm -hmm. like, if you see a shark bite something in slow mo, it's so freaky because like the jaws move detached from the mouth, you know, uh, from the from the lips. Right. And uh, you know, so got a bunch on that, and it, like that was a thing I was really pushing for the for the animators, you know, like oh, you know, we got to see that detail of the jaws moving detached from the from the lips because it just look it adds that extra freakiness even though it bites so quickly um you can see those uh you can see those details and you know um we've got the gills moving and you know uh, one nice little detail is that when a shark opens its mouth to bite its eyes roll back in its in its head oh wow so go in game and move the camera to look at the shark and open its mouth and you'll see that little detail happening. I love that. Uh, Brian Wynia, uh, that that uh, at the time was the the lead character artist, and now is a creative director um, at the studio, working on some some new exciting project that we haven't announced. Um, he is obsessed with uh, aquatic life and sharks. And the crazy thing is, we didn't know that 
um, when he when he joined Tripwire. But then after you know we saw the Man Eater project, he's like, dude, oh my god, I was like freaking out. And then I found out that during his wedding, his uh, wife had a um, they they had a shark cake made for his wedding. <laughs> it's like, okay, well he's the perfect guy. So you know, he, he did immense you know research and making sure the sculpt on the bull shark was just perfect and all the other wildlife. Um, so it was you know. It was, a lot of things just the planet really aligned for the project to you know make it you know because you know how it looks is so important and you know he yeah. really nailed just how that shark looks it just looks really cool really does and so when you've attacked a lot of hunters then you get a bounty hunter comes out which is kind of like a boss battle there these characters and they've all got different personalities and stuff have you got any tips for trying to battle them or how to best approach them? So, so, you know, one, um, there's many different ways that you can, you can go about tackling it. But what I personally like to do mm. is um, from under the water, I'll breach out of the water, uh, you know, do my lunge. And then if you look at the target, right, when you look at the target, if you hit bite, you'll bolt right, you'll just jet right to uh, the target. And then you can bite that person off the boat. Then I will then swim back around under the water, jump back out, and then use that whip shot mode ability where you go into slow mo yeah. and you throw the target back at them. Um, so that's you know that's the method that that I'll do. I'll wait for them to attack. I will dodge, and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll use the humans uh, as uh, projectile weapons um, against them. Um, and another little tip that, that you can do is uh, if you find turtles, uh, whip shotting a turtle because of the hard shell mm -hmm. um, will stun things, has a greater stun length to it. Um, so I would say those are, those are, the, those are the two real you know, good uh, you know, tips. Um, also, another tip that I, I don't know if a lot of people will know, but if you... Um, so on each one of the boats, you'll have the driver, and then you'll have like all the gunner guys. Yep. You kill the gunner guys. Um, the driver actually will just will actually jump off the boat. So it's one way to kill them a little bit quicker. Okay. So prioritizing them, and you don't even worry about the the driver. If you can get now, obviously when you get on the way bigger boats, it's a little bit more. It's a little bit more challenging. And then say so once you've defeated one of these bounty hunters, you, you unlock an evolution which allows your shark to mutate with new abilities. What are your favorite ones? So uh, I, I, really, I, I personally really like the shadow set. Um, that's the one that you get from exploring all the landmark objectives in each region. Um, and I'll do a little bit of intermixing. So like, you know, out of the three sets we have, we've got the bone set, we've got the bioelectric, and then we've got the shadow. Um, you get like a set bonus if you if you equip all of them onto all of your body parts. But I actually like to mix and match. So I'll do the bone body evolution, um, which gives me that active ability to put that armor on me and to like do the spin attacks, which is really good against the boats. Um, and then I'll put the shadow teeth on, which will allow me to like use that vampire ability where everything I bite, you know, I'm draining their life and adding to my own. And then I'll, uh, I'll either equip the shadow uh, tail, um, which actually shoots like a, a poison ink cloud at your target. It's like a, like a medium range projectile, which slows it down and, and does small chip damage to it. Um, or I'll equip the bioelectric tail, which does like a lightning blast, which can like electrocute uh, people. So I've still got a lot of stuff to unlock then, so, which is very exciting. So I've just unlocked the electric teeth, which I'm having fun with, because you, when you bite things, you stun them for a few seconds. And I think once you've bitten them 10 times in a row, they become shocked. But then that also wears off as well. So if you don't keep on at them, then they heal, I guess. Yep. And, and as you level that up, um, it has a bigger and bigger uh, AOE radius. Mm. So say you bite this one fish. Um, that radius will now electrocute other things that are that are around it as you right. as you upgrade that evolution. By the way, does the shark have a name? 
we never, we never, we never named the shark. And uh, it's funny, like people are like, well, what did you name the shark? Mm. You know, your head. And I, I, was, I don't have one. I couldn't <laughs> think of one that, that felt, you know, fitting for it. Makes sense. It's just the shark. It's the shark, isn't it? Yeah, it's just the shark, you know. Um, I mean, it's not going to come to that name if you call it, is it? So, I don't it mind, really but is. not for that reason. Probably just because it wants to eat you. Whatever you want it to be. Right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to call it the Sarah O'Connell Show Shark, then. I think yeah, that's a good exactly. Name. Exactly. Right? To me, it's the Bill Monk shirt. I mean, shark. <laughs> And so the, the shark starts off as a pup and then becomes a teen. And then at the moment, my shark is an adult. And I've noticed that some of the sewers I can't get into because it says elder. Is that the yep. final stage of evolution or does it go higher than that? There's one more after that called Mega. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, so you get quite a bit bigger. I'm very intrigued. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once you get Mega, you really feel ridiculously powerful um so you're an adult right now once you hit elder you actually get one more like lunge double jump out of the water as well oh wow so as an adult you have two as elder now you have three so it gets really uh, really ridiculous how far you can jump out of the water and what's the highest level you can get to so as i say i'm on level 10 at the moment what does that go up to uh 30. 30 okay by the way i love all the pop culture references and I, I saw that there's a pineapple under the sea and stuff like that. What are some of your favorites and did you have to change things or is it okay to sort of parody things in a, a game with us in that kind of context? Uh, well, uh, Matt Etten, our uh, writer, um, he, he's very in tune with, you know, all those types of things. So he really had a, a you know, we gave free reign to, you know, it's uh, kind of an organic experience with across the team um, with different people having different ideas, the environment artist, they had a whole bunch that they would like to have. And, you know, basically it was, uh, you know, it was literally, you know, anything that, that was funny <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, with, you know, um, just anything that felt right, you know, was free game of any ideas, but, you know, I would say, you know, um, the one that you mentioned, obviously, uh, the fire festival. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you found that one yet. Um, but oh, that, yeah, yeah. You know about the fire festival, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the, you know, I really want to go to it. I'm hoping I do another one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me know. Let me know uh, how, how it goes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, my God. That, that sounds like such a crazy nightmare. Um, and, uh, there's uh there's another one with like uh you know big like kraken beast you know that that um I really get a kick out of but there's a lot of them there's over you know there's over you know fifty of them um, mm. to find find and explore. Another thing I love is that because obviously the game's set underwater, you'd think that the entire game would just be blue and you're just swimming around, but it's not like that at all. It starts off in this dark dirty muddy water and then you know you go through different areas and you can see the sunlight pouring in and then when it's night you can see the light reflections and stuff so I, I love how the environment really feels different at different times of the day and also in different locations that was that was one reason why we actually picked a bull shark is uh you know it, we want to have a really like wide different diversity in environments and bull sharks can survive in fresh and salt water um, you know, and that's not to say like this game is definitely not realistic in any sense. <laughs> it's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. <laughs> exactly. I didn't know they could do any of that stuff. Right. You did, it's not it's, you know, science. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, um, that was, uh, that's just one of the areas that just helps give that, give that diversity, uh, in the game and an experience. And, and, uh, you know, yeah, I love how our, the, the time changes under the water just looks so cool, you know, day and night. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if you've noticed, but at nighttime, there's less humans out. And if you do find them, they're like partying in like bonfires. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, it's a nice, nice little touch. One, one thing that we had to cut out of the game that made me really sad was weather. We wanted to have the weather changing. Um, but 
there was a lot of challenges to get the like the water surface to be able to change mm. with the weather and um you know just sometimes you got to make that hard call of you know kind of like killing your your baby features um to make sure what you have is good and solid um but that would be something you know an eight or two or something like that i'd love i'm already thinking about like oh, this and this and this and this, this. Yeah, because, yeah, as you say, obviously a sunny day is easy enough because you just, once you've worked out the physics of the water, then you kind of had that across the entire game. But then when it rains and you've got the surface being impacted by rain and when it's windy, then yeah. obviously there, there's higher tides and the movement would be different and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think that's the kind of thing that you would sort of iterate on. Yeah, it would be awesome. You know, uh, I mean, we had nothing to announce on it whatsoever, but mm. it'd do a main eater too on on you know the next gen consoles on Unreal Five because when I oh, saw yeah. Unreal Five I was like, oh, <laughs> amazing! Um, can you imagine Main Eater Unreal Five with the wit the environments? Oh my God! Like, yeah, that, so that's my new that's my new dream. <laughs> that's, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Can you tell me about the the sound effects? How do you? Where did you record the noises of the sharks and the crocodiles? Are they just your pets at home that you've made go and take a bath or something? How did you get the audio? Uh, so lots of, you know, so, some of it was um, sound, bank, sound bank stuff. We, we have a really uh, creative team uh, mm. behind the audio. Um, you know, so they used every trick and tool in their disposal. Um, but one thing we did, you know, we had to get, really creative you know like because a lot of those animals don't actually make sounds and uh or at least the way you would per you know we perceive it um but that's not like fun or interesting in a, you know in a game it's kind of like you know you know in star wars right like in real life when spaceships are flying and shooting and stuff you wouldn't hear anything right but that would be really lame and boring so yeah so like for our wildlife and our creatures it's a lot of different like animals. Um, so like the shark actually, um, Andrew Deering, um, he's our uh, audio engineer. Um, he recorded his dog eating apples. So, you know what I mean? Like, I wondered this. Yeah, so, and then um, I have a, a, a pool in my backyard and mm. Andrew came over and you know, we had other people from the studio and just trying to find people and we would go under the water and scream. Like we had mics, <laughs> you know, like us screaming underwater and it's actually really freaking hard yeah. to scream underwater. Oh my God. And not actually suck the water in. Um, and, you know, or like yelling underwater and then, you know, we would find different tubes and things that we would like be, you know, squishing in the water, making sounds and splashing. And if anyone you know, saw it, be like, what the hell's wrong with these people? But, uh, um, you know, that, that was actually a lot of fun. You know, we, we yeah. had to do multiple sessions, you know, um, just to get all the like, you know, sounds and swishes and people screaming and, you know. It's, it's the, the ambient stuff really brings the game to life, doesn't it? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, sound, sound actually, uh, to you know, um, a lot of people don't realize it, but it's probably one of the most important aspects of a video game and a movie, mm. uh, because with good sound, it will actually trick you into thinking you saw something that you actually didn't see. Yeah. It's very fascinating. Like I've actually, you, you, you can look it up, you can watch videos where, where um, they've taken an animation and they'll do different sound passes. Mm. And and with different sound passes, you'll you'll your mind will will fill in blanks of yeah. seeing something, but you actually didn't see anything different. It's very very fascinating. But it's the audio, all, all the other guys always love when I say that because I have an animator background. And I'm like, you guys are the most. I most have a degree in animation. Oh, cool! I interviewed Don Han, the producer of The Lion King and Beauty and the Beast. Awesome! Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I will. Uh, I will forever forever love animation, all forms of animation. And mm -hmm. I would say the form of animation I have the most respect for is claymation. Yeah. Because that is, oh, it's so hard, right? Like- Get things to balance. 
Well, well, also too, like imagine like you're sitting there and you're doing this complex scene. Yeah. You accidentally bump the character or the character falls over and now you're trying to reset, you know, yeah. you're there like eh, click, eh, click. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, it's, you know, to me, it's like what, you know, um, it, it fascinates, it fascinates me people who work on it. It's so amazing. Like just how big and grandiose. And I just don't think people realize just how hard it is to do mm. claymation. Cause like, you know, with, um, computer animation, which what I have experience with, you know, um, I'm sitting there and if I want to undo it, I'm just like, delete key frames. Yeah. <laughs> Let me stretch it out. Let me do this. You know, uh, claymation you know no you know it's it's amazing do you know Ardman animation with wallace and gromit and chicken okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. i spoke to the co-founder of that peter lord oh cool that's awesome yeah. that's awesome uh, yeah Mad respect to that guy yeah in incredible he's worked on so much stuff and music videos and countless films and oscar winning things and yeah they're amazing yeah that's super cool What's the reaction been like? Oh, it's been, it's been amazing. It's been a dream, dream come true. I mean, obviously when you make something, you know, like you, you want people to like it. And, um, you know, uh, I didn't expect people to, to really like it as much as, as they are. You know, there's people are, are, are talking about it. They're, they're streaming it. You know, we've got tons of videos. People are, you know, some people hate it and they're talking about it and get, that's getting a bunch of views and some people love it and some people are arguing about it and, and, uh, you know, um, so I, I'm as happy as can be, you know, um, I, I, um, you know, like I said, this, this was a, a really, uh, hard, challenging project. And, uh, you know, when you, when you make it through the other end, you know, and then have people really love it, you know, and I think sometimes like some of the, some of the, the kind of the coolest things out there, you know, um, had a really challenging development, you know, and sometimes that's how you kind of break through and just make something weird. Cause you know, like there, there really wasn't a lot of, uh, examples that we could look up, look at for, you know, uh, shark combat, you know, and eating <laughs> yeah, that's very true. I can't think of many. Yeah, there's there's a there's a few, and those those are definitely definitely cool. But you know, when we're trying trying to set it up, it was you know it was extremely challenging to. Yeah, uh, exactly. And no, I can't I can't think of any that are a three D open exploratory world. I know some that are kind of side scrolling and stuff like that, but nothing to the sort of scale and scope that you created. Yeah, probably the, the the closest one would be Jaws Unleashed. Yeah. Um, that came back came out. Uh, you know, I think it was uh, 10, 10 years ago. And then uh, depth, you know, and depth is is uh, you know a really really cool game. So I mean, if you you know if uh, you or anyone else that, that's watching this likes you know this type of thing, checking out depth because that's a that's like a multiplayer combat game where one side are the um, humans and they're trying to get treasure, and the shark is you know as we play as the shark, you're hunting down the people trying to get the treasure. It's called depth. I'll check it out. It sounds fun. Cool. I can't wait till this pandemic is over. Yeah. So that I can go to just hang out at a bar. I find it so funny. Like you watch a movie now, mm. and uh, people like go up and they like shake their hand, or they're at a restaurant, and it's like, what is this foreign yeah. reality? You know, wow. I wish I could do that. <laughs> well, yeah. You you watch just the. A random rom com or a sitcom or something, and the family will come up and just hug each other. And it's like, don't do that; it's dangerous. Then you remember it's the before time when there wasn't a global pandemic. Yeah, you could do that. It's funny, isn't it? Oh God, I hope this does not become the new like. Oh, because you know, after nine eleven, like flying just fundamentally it just kind of sucked. Yeah. Like you know, and then and then now this, it's like just praying that. Uh, you know, we, you know, uh, it's, I would just hate to see a reality where everyone's just really afraid to shake someone's hand or yeah. give someone a hug, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, and just the simple, th it does make me super appreciative of, you know, like the simple things, you know, like I feel like I always took for granted going out to eat 
or just going going to, to a public place and just yeah. hanging. Um, so I'm, you know, whenever that's back, you know, I can't wait. <laughs> it's crazy. Like normally, in in a normal year, you'd start thinking, oh, "I'd love to go on vacation," and you start imagining somewhere else. And now I'm just like, "I'd love to go and watch a movie. I'd like to go out and eat somewhere. You know, go to a park and walk around." Yeah. When you're working on the game, and I appreciate so you're working games too. That multiplayer is massively complicated. And you're trying to introduce it to a world or an environment that you're setting up for the first time. But is it something you've considered, or something you'd like to bring into the man eater world, perhaps in the future? Yeah. So I mean, you know, um, in a lot of ways, when, when we worked on Man Eater, it mm. was super liberating for me to not worry about the multiplayer component. Yeah. Because the interesting thing that you know, um, probably a lot of people that just play games don't realize is that. Um, with multiplayer, there's a lot more limitations because of replication of, of, of you do, doing an action and someone else seeing the action that you do mm. um, in a fast enough time period where, where it feels fair and legit for the two people. Um, and then another interesting thing is, you know, online games, it's like, pe you know, people like cheaters or, or, or hackers, um, you have to put a lot of time and energy to protect those things, but it doesn't make the game any better or cooler. Like, but an immense amount of resources go to just combating that. So for, you know, in our history, we've only done multiplayer. So for me, it was like, ah, oh, you know, I don't have to worry about any of this, you know, cause I don't know how many times we, you know, with uh, the Killing Force series and the Red Orchestra series, we had a really awesome idea, but then we're like, oh yeah, but but um, this won't be performant enough to be replicated fast enough. And then we might have a way where like, well, what if you do it like this? And it's like, yeah, but then people can cheat that too easy. It's like, oh. So that's a really unfortunate thing about multiplayer games. Like if you didn't have to worry about people cheating or doing hacks, we'd actually have way cooler uh, experiences mm. in multiplayer because more time could be spent on the fun things that you want to do um but to answer your question uh you know so this project has been completely developed in this single player aspect um so i think for main eater it's very unlikely uh but it's something that maybe we could look at you know uh, if we if we do a sequel to the game if it's something that people really want but it's also like, it's kind of a cautionary thing too, because like if we did do it, I wouldn't want to take away what actually may, may, makes the single player experience special. Mm. A really good example is, so like, I love, uh, I love Fallout mm. and Skyrim, like, and, and obs just obsessed. I don't even know how much I played that. But uh, when Fallout 76 came out with the online element, um, it actually like, it, it, it missed the charm that I loved so much. Mm. Um, it, it didn't have that. So if we ever do it, we gotta make sure, and that's not a knock on them at all. Um, it just, we gotta make sure that, that what it is that people love about Mania that they experience and what they're picturing in their mind of multiplayer bringing doesn't actually take away anything and only adds stuff. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And have you, I appreciate, I don't think anything's been announced yet, but have you considered any DLC for, or expansion packs for Manita? Yeah, so we, uh, you, you know, obviously, obviously we, we wanted, you know, we really wanted to see how things are, are, are going, how people mm. like it, because, you know, this was, this was also one of the riskiest, riskiest endeavors we ever did, because it's so left field. Um, but we, we do have, uh, you know, we don't have anything to announce, but we've got, you know, we got people at the studio, um, you know, uh, you know, work, working on, working on some, some ideas and, and things like that. So, and I was thinking it'd be fun if you, in the future, you know how some games like Mortal Kombat will team up with and have Robocop or Terminator and stuff like that. But I was thinking it'd be cool to have like a, 1970s themed DLC like Amity Island kind of thing where everyone's in retro 70s clothes and you get to be 
like a augmented version of Jaws or something? Yeah, that would that would be definitely very very uh, very fun for mm. sure. That's a cool idea. Or you could take the shark to Crystal Lake and put a hockey mask on him. He could be hunting. <laughs> You know what? There's ne- there is not never a too crazy idea for me. Exactly. So hopefully we'll see all of those. You can have those for free, except for the movie studios will have to let you have them too. It's only site barrier. Yeah, that that's that's where things can get very uh, very tricky. It'll be fine. I'll email. I'll clear this all up in a couple of tweets, and we'll get it all sorted out. And then yeah. <laughs> awesome. Hey, awesome. <laughs> have developers got much access to the dev kits for ps5 so far and what what do you think about the technology and do you think you'll stay on this generation for a while or you'll move your next game will be on the next generation do you think and i appreciate you haven't announced anything yet yeah we we, yeah we have nothing to officially announce but but we you know we uh we're, we're working with both microsoft and 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 sony um and uh, you know the, the the new consoles are freaking awesome. Um, they're very very powerful. Um, you know, uh, I think I think for all of our future stuff, we'll definitely be working on the ne- on the next gen. You know, um, and the way they have them set up is you know they, they they'll you know you it's not it's not like you have to redo so many things to get it to work. Mm. It's just like it's way more powerful. You know, so so think of think of it as. You know, it's got, it's got, it's a way upgraded computer, you know, like a PC with, uh, you know, you know, um, you know, massive architectural enhancements. Um, it's interesting. So I, I think that when games first come out on the new consoles, there's not as big of a gap between the last console and the next one because they're kind of transitioning over. And it's usually towards the end of a console's life cycle that you get the very most out of the console and developers work out how to, and they really maximize everything with graphics and the, you know the game plays always improves because you're several iterations on in a series and mm-hmm. yeah i mean one big reason for that too is everything in the industry is moving so fast and you know generally video game development is a few years so you're 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 kind of, you're staggered mm-hmm. so um and then when the new consoles come out you know, um, some of it you need to be, you know, first party titles, obviously they're working directly, but for a lot of third party people like with you know, us or, you know, um, even, even really big third party companies, you know, depending where they are in the cycle of their development, they m- planets might align for them to be able to be on that new gen, but, but mm-hmm. they might not, you know, like they might have already released it, then they'll do some enhancements and put it on. And then the new thing that they're working on that's what then now they're like okay now we really know what we can do now we can take it to the next level so that's generally why you see that why you see that kind of occur that way um you know and i I think you know when these new gen you know consoles come out uh you know the thing i'm really excited for is seeing unreal 5 games because that is you know I'm always waiting for, you know, like that holy grail where um, the visual fidelity is no longer like a barrier to developers. Um, and, you know, e- even with even with Unreal 5, it still won't be there yet. But your, your sandbox now is so huge that it's really going to open up the creativity and the possibilities for game developers. I think unlike you know, unlike anything we, we've seen yet. Um, so I am, you know, I am really excited. You, you know, it's funny, I, I have this pet project that um, I've kind of kept secret for uh, over 20 years now, yeah. waiting for the technology to get to the point where I could actually make this thing. <laughs> and when I saw the Unreal 5 video, I was like, oh my God, like finally, uh, finally could could make this this happen. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm yeah I'm very excited about the the future of you know the future of gaming. I imagine your your next project is well underway because 
a period where the game's essentially done, but then it goes into QA for testing and then bug fixing and stuff like that. But then it gives the, the writers and the designers time to start thinking about the next project. How far along would you say you are in, with that? And when might we see something else or hear an announcement about what you might be picking up next? Mm. Man, you like to ask me questions that are going to get me in trouble, huh? Right? <laughs> It's, it's okay, we're, we're all friends here. Everyone's a friend on the Sarah Connor show, so you'll get in zero trouble. Oh, oh really? You get, get, right. get, um, I, uh, we're, we're, in, uh, we're in pre-production mm -hmm. uh, of, of the, next, the next title. Um, can't really, it's it difficult to say when we'll be ready to uh, announce something because mm -hmm. we're still so much in kind of the, the, you know, the expiration and, and things like that on it. But I, it, you know, it's, it's easy, it's easily, um, it's definitely, no one's going to hear anything about it for over a year right. easily, um, maybe potentially two, but that, that could, that, that could change, but, yeah. but we're, we're really, we're really, uh, you know, we're really pumped to do it. And, you know, like I was saying, you know, um, I, I would, uh, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but I would, you know, I'd love you know, if we can make it where our next title is Unreal 5, that would just be just amazing. Because, like I said, that's the new, that's the new hotness. That's the new most amazing <laughs> thing. So um, that's what I, I would love it to, to be on. Sony has asked any games, I think, they're sending for certification be compatible with PlayStation 5. Is that something you're already sort of thinking about and working on for Man Eater as well to make sure that it will be compatible, backwards compatible? With oh, yeah. I'm not sure where I'm allowed to talk about on that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. That's completely fine. That's, yeah. that's just in a massive checklist of things that are theoretically fine that they'll probably won't ever check. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so basically, if someone were to buy the game now, they know that they'll be able to enjoy it on this console and the next console, and that's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we've entered the can't say anything section of the interview. So, yeah, exactly. Completely changing the subject now. Tell me a fun fact about you, something people may not know. It can be a party trick or anything like that. Kind of boring. Uh, fun fact about me. Uh, you know, I, I honestly, I, that, that, one, that one stumps me. Um, uh, I, I have a, you know, I'm, I would, I wouldn't say it's a fun fact, but, uh, you know, I love, I love to laugh and I love comedy. Um, I mean, that probably comes through a little bit with, uh, you know, you know, Man Eater or yeah, yeah. Uh, Killing Floor 2. That's not really a fun fact, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but it is. So you're continuing on this thread then. Who are your favorite comedians and who or what makes you laugh? So I, I have a wide range of, you know, um, things that like smart highbrow comedy all the way to the like dumbest, like the, like so dumb it makes your brain hurt kind of comedy. So like, you ever see the Tim and Eric show? Yeah, I, I met Tim and Eric years ago. Oh, Their yeah. billion dollar movie. Yeah, so like, I, I you know, I, I love that. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I, Jim Carrey makes me laugh a lot because he's very like expressive and very, very physical in how he does everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that he's, he's definitely like out there and a real deep guy. So, you know, I really like, I really like his stuff and, you know, um, uh, you know, Adam Sandler's done a lot of really great stuff. Uh, Chris Parnell, um, I find him hilarious. Just yeah. the way he does his delivery of stuff. Um, yeah. So, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I'd say that the show that I'm binge watching right now is uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Oh my God. The writing in that is so good like um you know my dad actually had never never seen it and i i told him about it and then he he watched like i don't know like three seasons in like two days or something <laughs> it's great when you find a show like that and you can just go right i'm going to spend 10 hours watching this in a row then i'm going to watch it for another 10 hours tomorrow and it's it's a rare thing but it's great when that happens yeah especially when it's something that you you kind of like saw, but then you, you know, got distracted and you missed. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, there's like five seasons. <laughs> You're like, all right, I'm going <laughs> to. You know, 
I'd say one one sh one show I'm really looking forward to checking out is uh, Space Force. Oh yeah. I'm oh, that's good. And I'll be so happy I'll bust out a glass of wine and watch the Space Force tonight. Oh yeah, well that, that's tonight and the, the weekend sorted, I guess. Yep. But another question I must ask too is obviously there's been loads of shark movies and documentaries and stuff. If a director came up to you and they wanted to turn Man Eater into a film, would you want to do that? I mean, I sure. I mean, if there's, uh, if there's something that made sense, you know, like, you know, uh, where it would be, where it would work. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be, that would definitely be intriguing. It would have to be, uh, you know, Chris Parnell would have to be involved though. Right? Oh yeah. Well, I'd love to see a live action version of that. I think it'd be a lot of fun. It would, yeah, it would definitely have to be a comedy on, you know, it'd be on the range of like really, you know, really intellectual and, and very, very stupid. So, yeah, um, yeah I think that would be awesome. <laughs> I've got lots of things to arrange after this that I need to tweet and get directors yeah. involved and get the Jaws DLC set up. Right. Lots of lists for the weekend. So finally, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Uh, just, you know, thank you so much, guys, for all of your support. Um, you know, like, we would be nothing without that. And, um, you know, it's it's it's... It's such an honor and a blessing that um, to be able to even make something like this, you know, um, like I said, we started out as modders and, you know, to be where we are today. And, you know, I'm really excited for the future. Um, and, uh, you know, I just everyone stay safe, um, stay, stay positive, and just remember, you know, through adversity comes prosperity and your, 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 the, the way, you know, if you stay positive, you can make positive things happen. So, and I know, you know, it's really hard right now, um, but things are going to get better. And I really feel like once this is all done, we'll be even better off than we were before. Um, so stay strong, have fun playing, you know, games and, you know, hanging out with your loved ones and, and, and be safe. Well, Bill Monk, thank you so much for your time today. It was a lot of fun talking to you, and I'm very much looking forward to playing more Man Eater and leveling up and watching Space Force as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, and thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up, and leave lots of lovely comments. I'll see you all again soon for another episode of The Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye.